Hello, I'm Daniel, and I like taking things apart, like this. Today, we're going to look at the maze products, which are wireless storages, such as this one here, which is a very simple USB stick, which mostly looks like a USB stick, but if you look very closely here, there is a little wireless icon here which indicates that this has wireless functionality. And if you look at the diagram right next to it, you actually see that it has an antenna, and that's uh, how you can access the storage besides just plugging it into your USB port. Now they also have a similar product, which is this one here, also wireless storage, but a bit larger. So I assume it just has some more capacity probably for the battery. So it actually can run off battery and maybe a bit more storage size. Uh, they also mention some kind of IoT processor thingy. Um, I'm not exactly sure what it is. Uh, it says something MIPS here. So it's probably running something like OpenWRT, but that's just an assumption. Now let's actually have a look in one of my cameras at uh, some other devices I have here. Uh, which also come from the May. Uh, there is this one. I put a nice sticker on it. Uh, it's called WFD020, the 32 gigabyte version, which is in fact running OpenWRT. So it's quite easy to get into it. It's uh, running Telnet on its default port. And if you just search the web for a certain keyword, then you will figure out how to just use their default login as root and you can very much take over this device. Uh, it came with a bit of a manual uh, which is uh, actually written in Chinese um, so it's uh, not much use for me. Uh, yeah, but it's very nice to look at. It looks quite sophisticated already so it's not like one of the shady things you might think of when you think of like Chinese companies. And the one thing I showed you first today, uh, this here from the website, I also have this one, uh, but I've already taken it apart. That's what I showed you uh, in the other camera before. So it looks like this here. And let's uh, check the design first. So it actually has an SD card on it right here in the middle. Um, there is no brand on it or something whatsoever. So when you look very closely at it, you will not see anything there. It's just blank. Uh, then there's this chip here. It's from Genesis Logic, uh, which just exposes the SD card through the USB connector here. And then there is another chip from Marvel or Marvel. I don't know. It's spelled with two L's. Um, and actually, uh, that's one of their former products. Uh, they just sold that part to NXP, another company, in 2019. Uh, there is a small antenna here. And you may notice this very tiny chip. It has eight legs. So I'm assuming that this is an SPI NAND flash. Um, it's probably something like a megabyte in size. And let's uh, take a look at the back as well. Uh, here is the battery. Uh, there is two LEDs here. So when I press the button at the side, you will see that one of the LEDs flashes. And if I keep pressing it for a while, you will see this blue light come up. And that indicates uh, that the device is now running and opening its wireless access point. Uh, let's turn it off for now. And you will see, if you look very closely here, um, it's a bit hard to see in the camera. I'm trying my best. Uh, there's the three pads here. So I was assuming it's kind of a debug port and lo and behold, uh, I actually got UART from it. Uh, so there is one, um, well, if, if you look at it yourself and if you buy this, uh, you will see that one of them must be ground because uh, it's connected straight to everything which uh, goes right around the board. And then there's the two other ones. And the outermost one here at the very edge, that's the output pin. Uh, the other one is probably input, but I haven't tried it. 
Um, I soldered a wire, it already came off because I'm not very good at soldering, you know, wires just like those. Uh, that's how I got some output and I was able to actually read some logs. Um, let me show them here. So I always take some notes and stuff like that and I collect all the information I can find in local directories. Uh, so that's why you will see a lot of files showing up here now. Um, yes, I did manage to also find some data sheets uh, for the actual processor on here. So that is a 88MW302, uh, which is also used for IoT stuff, like if you uh, look into the documentation for AWS or also Alibaba's wireless and IoT kits. Uh, then you will find this processor among others. Um, now here is one of those uh, log files I was mentioning. Actually it's not here. Crap, where did I put it? I have a bunch of other files actually uh, which I put in a different directory. It's mostly because I'm uh, doing a lot of research so it's quite hard for me to uh, kind of organize things, you know, I'm piling up like gigabytes of files uh, But let's see so uh, Let's go to this firmware directory here And lo and behold there is uh, lots more files and yes, I actually did manage to also get a firmware binary here um, uh, Well, that's a different story for later. Uh, let's uh, show you the log file I got um, that's uh, I actually obtained it through Minicom. There's other ways, but you know, that's what I went with uh, So the first output you can see here. Uh, it says something about calibration uh, That's just from pressing the button for a very very short time and Then when I press it longer, I get the other output which uh, kind of makes sense uh, that it's also getting longer now and that shows us some initialization output. So it's uh, stuff like here, for example, it's initializing the TCP IP stack. So since we need networking, we will have that. Um, there's this WSGI handler here. WSGI is uh, for the network interface. So uh, that's the HTTP based protocol that we're talking to. Like when you want to access a file or something, uh, you can download it. And it also mentioned something about web dev support. I made certain attempts to actually access this through web dev. So the simplest thing I could think of was just uh, using the Fuse driver. So in FreeBSD there is a web dev Fuse FS driver. Uh, I wrote a bit of a script for it. Uh, that's this one here. Um, so you would just say mount web dev FS and then give it the uh, username, address, and stuff like that. Um, oh, you actually saw here is a password in here, uh, which I managed to also find somewhere uh, in one of their apps. It wasn't really hard to find, so whatever, you can see it here. Uh, it seems like it's a kind of default password. I'm actually not sure what it's used for by now, uh, but I assume it's for some MQTT broker uh, just for the endpoint. Anyway, uh, that didn't work. I was just getting an error immediately uh, because apparently it doesn't uh, support the HTTP verbs uh, which are necessary for web dev. Uh, one of them being the MK something for creating directories. Anyway, so um, I actually did take some notes on that as well. Uh, you see there are two curl scripts here. Uh, one of them I assume was for making a directory. Let's see what it says. Ccat. So ccat is just like cat but a bit more colorful. So that's colorful cat. Oh, uh, that's uh, what I tried to use for uploading a file actually, which makes sense because it's called curl upload.sh. Um, yeah, let's see in my notes. You see there is a notes.md file. Um, Let's look at it in the pager actually. Or no, let's uh, use something colorful again. Uh, there is a beautiful Markdown viewer called Glow. Now if I pipe this into less, this will 
kind of uh, make it less colorful again. Um, otherwise, I would need to scroll up. So whatever, screw it. Let's scroll. Uh, it's also a bit garbage because of whatever line length they use here. Um, so yeah, I actually already told you about the basics, the product website and so on. And now let's go some further down to my attempts to run curl. So, well, the first thing I actually did was running nmap. nmap is quite a simple tool. Uh, it can just search the network for uh, services running on certain known ports, or you can also do a very extensive scan and stuff like that. So it saw that there is a HTTP service running here, uh, but nothing else so far, which, uh, yeah, already um, was what I assumed because this is really just a very simple ARM Cortex something chip. So it's not as capable as others. And then it makes sense uh, that it also just runs some very limited services. Uh, in the response headers, you could also see that it does indeed come from Marvel. Um, they use this Marvel-WM name for the server. And now let's see. So, uh, actually look at uh, looked at this in a web browser first. And through that, I obtained quite some files, like uh, JavaScript files they're using to enrich their interface. Uh, one of them is for showing system diagnostics. So this is how I got some extra output, uh, like this here. Uh, it shows us some version of the SDK, uh, the access points SSID, and then a list of connected devices. So, uh, well, now you know my MAC address. Um, and then some other important information, probably, which, uh, I don't know. I mean, CPU frequency, who cares? The architecture, okay, that might be useful at some point later. Uh, but we already know it's ARM Cortex, so, yeah, whatever. Um, hey, you can get more information about the firmware versions. Uh, now this time it's not encoded in JSON, but in XML instead, for whatever reason. Uh, I guess they actually do like XML though, because I also found it in uh, their web services, uh, which we will get to later on. And now let's see about web dev. So you can actually obtain a list of files from a slash web dev endpoint. Um, yeah, I was always dumping the headers here and also using the compressed flag for curl, but that doesn't really matter now. Uh, so. Of course, when uh, the drive was empty, there was uh, no files to list here. Um, I did copy a file to it, actually, uh, through just the uh, USB port and my laptop. Uh, so that, well, worked as expected, because uh, then it's just a similar, uh, uh, just a stupid USB drive similar to whatever other drive you have. Um, but then uh, if you don't connect it uh, to your laptop, uh, but you just give it power, then it would uh, open up the wireless access point. Well, no, when you press the button to start it, then it would just fire up the access point. Anyway, so I tried the mk call command, which is for creating a directory. Uh, which you can read in the web dev specification. Um, but apparently that didn't work. It just gave an error of 500. So that means internal server error. Well, and the WSGI handler says it failed. Whatever that means. Okay, so I couldn't get very far with this. Uh, I plugged it into my laptop again and looked at the SD card in there. So that's uh, just uh, through the USB storage interface. And I found something interesting at some offset actually. I'm not exactly sure uh, what it means, if it's some extra firmware stuff or something. Um, yeah, but I saved it for later. Uh, there was a bit of other stuff scattered across the device, but yeah, I, I couldn't really make much sense of it. I just kept this part for now. Um, now let's uh, look at the app. So if you want to obtain an app for Android, 
uh, you can very much just search the web for APK files. So if you just search for AirDisk Pro, that's the app's name here, uh, and APK, uh, then you will be able to find some of these files. Uh, you can just download them. I have uh, three versions now on my machine here. We can actually have a look at that. Uh, so I have this uh, app directory here, AirDisk Pro. And well, ls. There you go. So I have versions 2.2.3, 2.4.0 and 2.5.0. Uh, the 2.5.0 version also had a, da a date on it, so I know from when it is. And I assume that's the most recent version. And I think I actually downloaded it from their website even. It was a bit hard to find if I remember correctly, but anyway. Um, yeah, there's the tool which allows you to uh, kind of extract these files. It's called APK tool. Um, yeah, I have a wrapper script around it, so uh, it's a bit easier to use for me. But anyway, so APK files are uh, basically archives, kind of like zip files, uh, but they're uh, tailored towards uh, Android specifically. And when looking at one of the output directories now, I actually found the file uh, named lib dm sdk so dm is short for dame as i learned uh, that's actually what you also find printed on the manual so uh, yeah let's uh, look again uh, you know i have some of these manuals here uh, so this here is from the uh, white dongle the wfd 020 it's very hard to see in the camera i need a better setup but yeah never mind for now um, yeah and well the other one here you know um by the way those manuals already also give you some information if you look inside of this one here for example you can see the device's ip address is uh, written here right so it's a bit easier if you want to scan the network and you ju just don't want to spend hours on you know finding the right subnet and whatever devices you find in there Okay, so uh, back to the app. Um, the easiest way to just uh, look at something like an app or a firmware image uh, is to just run strings over it. Uh, strings is a very simple command. Uh, you just write strings and then a file name. And then, well, you see I already uh, looked for something in that. Um, you will get a list of strings. Actually, uh, there is an error here because I didn't write the directory first. Okay, so let's look at this version. And you will see there is quite some strings it can find. Uh, so that's kind of handy when uh, we want to analyze it later on. And if we scroll down again, um, that's actually also where I found the password uh, that you saw earlier. Uh, it was something, I think, with 8372, whatever. Yeah, there it is. Um, yeah, so that's probably for, uh, as I mentioned, an MQTT broker. Uh, if you look at the strings around here, um, well, there is uh, this one. It's uh, from some library, MQTT something. Um, so I assume some of their devices also support MQTT. Uh, I guess not this one because I couldn't find any indicators for it. Uh, and yeah, and further down you also see there is... Uh, more about MQTT stuff here, like uh, for publishing messages and stuff like that. Okay, but let's uh, get back to my notes. Um, I could find a bunch of extra information here. Uh, one of them is uh, this quite interesting string here. It's a triple nine, and then in parentheses m.03. Um, from my understanding, this uh, is another description for the device name. So if you're already confused by now, um, you will see that these devices here, they have names like uh, this one here, actually has the name WFD016. So that's uh, what is printed here in very small letters here on the back of the device. There you see, 
WFD016. Um, but if you look at the product website again, what I showed you earlier, uh, then you remember um, maybe from the URL, uh, they have a different name here. And if you uh, scroll up again, uh, there's this other name coming up here. And if you uh, look at the devices board, you will actually also see its name printed here. Uh, you just um, you know, need to remove the battery. Uh, be very careful with that, by the way, if you uh, look here, you will see that it's kind of glued together. Uh, so it's not very easy to detach. I have done that before, so it was a bit easier for me. Anyway, um, it doesn't want to come off again, of course. Uh, well, the board name, uh, you can just believe me or I will just try it again. Yeah, so the board name is uh, printed here as well. Uh, once again, you can't really read it in the camera. Anyway, uh, I can read it again for you. Uh, it says w3dmsys.com. So dmsys.com is one of their websites, also the one that is open here, as you can see from the URL bar. And well, the name, it's nw6216f. And behind that is another code, which is x0437 or j7, whatever. Um, could be something like manufacturing timestamp or something. I don't know. Doesn't really matter for now anyway. Um, let's get back to my notes. So uh, this version below here, that's kind of the firmware revision from my understanding. And then I found this uh, URL string here where you can just uh, ask for a certain firmware upgrade well, to kind of get the latest version. So uh, from the app, you can actually upgrade the firmware on the stick. Okay. Um, so I retrieved some of these URLs. I was using uh, this one here. Uh, we can actually just do that uh, just to show you again. So that's curl uh, dmsys.com. And then let's see what I have in my history. It's get XML something, and lo and behold, we will get a response. Uh, yeah, it even says uh, for the update, well, it fixed some bugs, uh, whatever that means. And well, uh, you may also notice uh, I put a version code in here. Uh, I'm not exactly sure which ones are valid, so. Um, I guess it can be arbitrary because you should always be able to upgrade from a version to something higher. Uh, I also tried various things. And then you see this custom code here. So as I mentioned, I assume that's uh, kind of another name for the product always. Um, so in this case, it's a 115 and then V.01 in parentheses. Uh, you can actually specify the language. I noticed that at least for this one here, uh, you can get a different uh, variant. Uh, you will just see underscores here. Uh, that's uh, because of the fonts on my system. I don't have the Chinese characters. Uh, you may also notice some other underscores here. Uh, yeah, whatever. Um, so, but this is not the latest version actually. I would really like to have a more uh, recent revision. Um, and there's a reason why. And that's a very good moment to have another look again at my forward logs. So, remember, when I was booting up this device, it was also showing some version information. Uh, where is it actually? Good question. Where is it? Ah, there we go. Um, it has a timestamp in it. And the timestamp says something from 2017. Now I looked at the firmware of this A115 thing. Uh, that was version 1.1.25.2. 1 
and that's an older date in there. Now if you recall from uh, the beginning of the notes here, I was getting some information on the firmware version. So let's have another look here. It says FW2 equals 1.1.34 something. So this is more recent than the 1.1.25 something, which I could from get from the web. So somehow they managed to ship a more recent firmware than they offer for download, which is a bit sad. Um, that means at least uh, that we have another challenge because uh, now of course I would like to obtain the firmware from the device itself. But yeah, of course, that's a bit harder than just uh, downloading it from the website, right? Anyway, so let's get back down the notes again. And uh, let's see what else I could figure out. So, well, from the app I got some other information actually because, uh, you know, I already showed you uh, there's this password in there that's quite interesting. Um, and then there is also this q.dmsys.com, which I haven't gotten around to yet. I just assume that uh, whatever this 61613 is, uh, is the port name. Um, I looked at, well, the IP address. That's actually in the range of Alibaba. So the Alibaba group is uh, kind of like Amazon, but in China. Um, and then I look down a bit further, and there is a bunch of more strings in the app, um, which actually connects you to some kind of cloud service. And you can already see this is all plain HTTP, and even if you open this on the web, you don't even get redirected to HTTPS. So this is not the ro most robust thing to use. Um, there's this get recommended websites thing. I have no clue what it's about, but it gives you lots of URLs like uh, btkitty, btkitty.red, uh, btbt whatever, btmavi.info, btmeet.com. Yeah, kind of nonsense to me. Um, yeah, also uh, base64 encoded. Uh, well, those uh, strings which uh, make up the username and password I found, um, yeah, that might be handy for later. Uh, yeah, maybe I can use it for something like uh, basic authentication or something, but yeah, I still assume it's for the MQTT broker. Yeah, I haven't gotten around to that yet. Um, now, uh, again, from the SDK from the app, uh, that was, uh, well, that was just an SO file, so it's a shared object, as you know it from Linux. Uh, there were some content type headers, which is uh, quite common in HTTP, so the HTTP protocol allows specifying uh, something about the payload. So you can tell that the payload is actually a URL, for, well, form encoded uh, like a URL for a website. So when you send a form uh, from a HTML site, uh, then that's what's uh, used by default from your browser. But of course, you can also do this programmatically. Um, yeah, I found some more interesting strings. I'm not yet sure what they are about. Uh, but anyway, I also tried to send uh, post requests to the uh, USB stick. That returned a 200 message. So 200 is the HTTP status code for something successful. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It didn't really uh, get me any further. Well, and I actually loaded the file also in Ghidra. Uh, Ghidra is a reverse engineering tool from the NSA, thankfully open sourced uh, just recently. Um, and I could actually find some references to the HTTP request stuff, uh, so I know it's actually being used uh, somewhere. 
well, probably because uh, the SO file is still a native file and, you know, that needs to be called again from something on a higher level. Anyway, uh, here is a bunch of more URLs from the app, uh, as I mentioned, probably for the cloud account. And, well, the most recent thing I found out is uh, there's something called MicroOS. MicroOS uh, is, well, something uh, like a tiny operating system, like a real-time operating system uh, for small ARM and similar processors. Um, Amazon is providing something simple, so from uh, AWS, when you register for an account, and you uh, set up IoT or whatever stuff, uh, then that will at some point lead you to the SDK for the uh, Amazon real-time operating system. And this one here is quite similar. And I actually found the file um, in one of the subdirectories, which uh, starts with a very, very similar header to uh, one of the firmware images that I got. Anyway, so that's it for now. And I guess in the next video, I will show you uh, how I could actually get started analyzing uh, the firmware image in Ghidra. So, see you next time.